Hello and welcome to our latest digital course for the Isle of Axholme and Hatfield Chase Landscape Partnership. This course is all about archaeology on the Isle of Axholme. So, before we get started, while it's not essential, in order to get the most out of this online course, I do recommend that you have a pen and paper to hand, and that's just so you can make any notes if you want. It really isn't essential, but if you do have a printed copy of the Isle of Axe Home uh, map, that could be quite useful if you just want to mark off the spots that we're talking about or at least see where we are geographically. And then your handbag, a work bag, a school bag, any bag that you use on a day to day basis, just for an activity we have at the end. Now, going through this course, this is is of course digital, so you can pause us at any time. However, there will be a suggested breakpoint halfway through as well. And I do recommend that if nothing else, you use that breakpoint to take a step away from the laptop or the screen that you're watching this on, just to give yourself a break. <clears throat> so the aims for this course. This course aims to increase your understanding of archeology span found on the Isle of Axome and Hatfield Chase area. By the end of this course, you should have an increased understanding of the Isle of Axome landscape. You should be able to identify some of the key archaeological sites on the Isle and understand how to interpret some artefacts. There we go, right. Before we get into it though, I do want to give you a quick overview of how this course has come about. So this course is part of the Isle of Axome and Hatfield Chase Landscape Partnership. Now this is a huge project that is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and is being organised through North Lincolnshire Council. Now this is a project aimed at helping people to reconnect with their landscapes, specifically around the Isle of Axome and Hatfield Chase areas. This is divided into 16 different projects of which Presenting the Past is one of them. So Presenting the Past is focusing on three different areas. So we have been looking at the Parish of Belton, the Parish of Oston Ferry and the Parish of Haxey. There we go. And what we aim to do is to work with people in those areas to identify how they want to explore the history and the heritage of their area. And as part of this, we identified that they wanted a few courses, and this is the result of that, and of course, all about archaeology on the Isle. Now, our project presenting the past is being run by Heritage Lincolnshire. And so we are a charity who aims to improve and to celebrate the heritage of Lincolnshire and we work all across the county in all different ways. We have a commercial archaeology unit, we have um, the Lincolnshire Heritage Open Days, we help organise in-house, we run courses, we do field work out and about, we work with volunteers and we always have a good building preservation project going on as well. So we do lots and lots and lots. And if you're interested in finding more about us, I do recommend you look us up on Google. Just type in Heritage Lincolnshire and you can find out all the different ways you can get involved or even become a member. And lastly, who am I? Who is this voice talking to you from the other side of the screen? I am Lydia Hendry. I'm a community archaeologist for Heritage Lincolnshire and I've been working with them for a few years now. Now, I will confess I am not from the area myself, but in a way that has made this Present in the Past project all the more exciting to me because I've really been able to immerse myself in the fascinating history and archaeology of the area. And I found that an absolutely brilliant experience and I'm really excited to show you some of the things that we've found. And so without further ado, let's get started. This course is split into two sections. We're going to be looking at landscape archaeology and all, all the sites that are situated in the landscape. And then after the break, we're going to be looking at some of the artefacts that we find there. So you can see the little tagline I've put down here, how the aisle was created, used and abused. 
and certainly we are going to be looking at some slightly more controversial topics as we go throughout. Now you may recognise this slide if you've been on the Farming on the Isle course, but I do just quickly want to go through it again so that we understand how the Isle was created and why it is so attractive to people to live on. So when we do archaeology, we have two different areas we look at. We have the solid geology and the drift geology. Now, the solid geology is the ground rock. It's deep, deep, deep under the soil that you see today. The oldest solid geology that we find in this country is Triassic, which was laid down around 2200 million years ago. No, 220 million years ago, sorry. Now it's interesting because it is Triassic that we find underneath the Isle of Axome. There you go, so you can just see I've created a little island there and this is representing the Isle of Axome here. Now, of course we had the Ice Age. So 300,000 years ago, the entire county was covered in an ice sheet that was hundreds of meters deep. Now the weight and the strength of this ice eroded away a lot of this rock and created what we call till deposits. So this is very, very clay-like soil where the rock's been really ground down. Then of course, once the ice age ended, we get a few different things happening. So first of all, the lack of vegetation allowed the wind to erode the softer soils and dig away at them. And then on places like the Isle of Axome, this windblown soil gathered to create the geology on top. In these deeper areas, peat deposits grew as it became more and more waterlogged and rivers such as the Trent, which surrounded the Isle of Axome, brought in alluvial deposits. And these are the soils that rivers bring in. And this is very, very, um, a very, very productive landscape. You've got lots and lots of different nutrients being brought in by the rivers. Peat, as we know, is a very rich material. So this is becoming quite an attractive area to grow and to live. And then this is an image from a historical atlas of Lincolnshire by Bennett and Bennett. I do recommend you have a look at it if you're interested in Lincolnshire because it is a fantastic book, just taking you through all the different aspects uh, to be aware of. Now you can see the Isle of Axome in the solid geology. This is the Triassic rock here, creating a lovely little island. And then that's been built on with the alluvial soils and the peat surrounding to create this very, very distinctive area in the Lincolnshire landscape. And I just wanted to include this picture as well because I find it quite interesting. Isle of Axome up here, and you can see the rest of Lincolnshire is very much almost in a north to south orientation. You've got the wolds coming down, you've got the cliff coming down, you've got the valleys and the marshes coming down and that's because this is the direction that the ice sheets were moving they were almost like when you put your fingers in sand and pull them across you create grooves it's almost like that's what the ice was doing to the landscape and so that's how the Isle of Axone was created in this landscape of Lincolnshire. So sometimes it's quite interesting to think what would we expect to see we have an island, we have an island surrounded by rivers, a very, very marshy landscape, lots and lots of water, lots of peat growing. What would we expect to see as archaeologists if we're coming into the landscape for the first time? Well, one answer could be water mills, lots of water, therefore lots of water mills using the landscape. However, interestingly, we have few to none in the Isle of Axome from the Middle Ages, which is when water mills are being used. And this is despite the huge amount of water that was present. Now we think this is because the water was simply not flowing quickly enough. This is more of a marshy area than it is um, flowing rivers. And the other industry you might expect to see is actually religious houses and peat digging. So religious houses can be represented by churches, they're found in the central villages and of course we still see them standing across the country today. And in the Isle of Axone we do also have a few monasteries. So for example the House of Carthusian Monks at Melwood near Oston Ferry, we, where we can still see the earthworks today. 
Now, religious houses used a few different things to um, create money, to create income. And one of those was peat digging. So that's digging up the peat for sale elsewhere. And this was an industry we do think they were using in the Isle of Axon. So not so many water mills. We're looking for more religious structures in the area. And then another industry that is quite influential on this landscape is drainage and reclamation. Now, because the area was so marshy, we see in the 1600s, people coming across going, we could improve this land, we could drain it, create it uh, a more amicable farming environment. Now, this is where I was hinting at when I was saying we're going to look at some controversial topics, because this was actually a hugely controversial project at the time. As you can see, I've written there, a third of the land that was drained was taken away from the peasants who were living there as payment to Vermoyden. So the local population, they were used to living with the marshes. They happily worked with it all day long. And so they didn't want the work carried out. And of course, once it was carried out, they then lost a lot of the land as well. But this is important to understand because the way it was drained is they introduced warping drains. Now these drains let the land flood um, during the high tides, which let the alluvial soils really accumulate. The rivers dropped their soils and then the water was drained away. And so what he was doing was he was building layers and layers and layers of soil upon the original landscape. This means that any archeology span from before the 1600s has been covered by potentially meters of soil. And so we today are really going to struggle to see it. And that is going to obscure our view of, past in the, of the past in this area. So just something to be aware of. And of course, another really important industry to be aware of is agriculture. It is the primary use of the, use of the land today with wheat being the main crop historically. Now, this is also going to affect the archaeology that we see, because as people plough, they are distributing artefacts over a field. They're digging up, they're uh, removing, changing, destroying some of the archaeology underneath the ground. So that's going to change how we view the archaeology. And manure spreading, muck spreading, back in the days where the farmers would collect the manure from um, people's back gardens, from their pigs, um, mixed in with that would be the domestic waste, so the broken pots, the broken plates as people threw them up the houses. And then so when you manure spread it on a field, you would also be spreading on all these artefacts from domestic dwellings. So that's why we do find quite a lot of bits of broken pottery in farmers fields today. So that's what we expect to see. And that's the things that might change how we see what we see. So let's get started looking at some key sites on the Isle of Axone. Now you can see on the side, I have put a little timeline. So this is uh, the point furthest away from today. And down here, we've got 2000 AD, we've got today. We are going to be working our way through this timeline chronologically, just to keep it a bit simpler and we're going to be dotting around the landscape as required. So we're going to start in the Stone Ages. So the Stone Ages are the Neolithic and the Mesolithic on my timeline, um, with the, Neolithic, the Mesolithic, sorry, being the older one. So this is the Mesolithic, the Middle Stone period. Now this is after the Ice Age, but before farming becomes a, um, established in the UK. So we have people who are hunter gathering, they are moving across the landscape. They don't perhaps have many permanent settlements because they are following food seasonally around. So our first site is actually just to the north of Oston Ferry. So you can see a little arrow here, just pointing it out. Now a field walking exercise, and that's when people walk across the field and see what they can see found 178 pieces of worked flint. Now this came mainly from the Mesolithic period, but a few bits from the um, Neolithic period as well. No structures were found, so just pieces of flint. Now flint was an incredibly useful tool to work with and is um, incredibly important for us to help identify Stone Age sites. Now you can see we have the river here, so this site is very, very close to the edge of the aisle. And this probably would have been quite a marshy area 
just on the side and then this would have been rising up you can see those contour lines starting so this is just on the edge of the aisle now a mesolithic site was probably only used sporadically so it may have been a seasonal base camp for hunting in these marshes very very productive landscape lots of duck lots of fish lots of things to um, hunt and feed on and so this would have been a good spot overlooking the marshes to prepare your tools, prepare your weapons before going hunting. So quite likely a seasonal base camp. Moving on to the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, we are going to move to just to the north of Haxi this time. Now here, a variety of artefacts have been found during general farm workings. No structures, which, to be honest, isn't altogether uncommon for the Neolithic period. We do struggle to see structures often in this time frame. But over a very, very concentrated area, so quite a small area, we have found a variety of tools, which has led people to suggest there might be a Neolithic home base or settlement in the area. However, more research is going to need to be done to see if we can actually identify any structures that would confirm this theory. Now this is a slightly different one in a similar location. This is an image from Google Maps. And if you're interested in trying to find out more about the archeology span of an area, having a route around on Google Maps can actually be really useful. So satellite imagery can show a number of different things. And in this field, it's showing what we call crop marks. And this is when the growth of the crops above the ground is being affected by the archaeology underneath the ground because the roots are either being restricted or given more water because of what people have done underneath the soil. Sorry about that. So if you have a look, you can see we've got some circles, we've got a nice teardrop shape there, you've got some lines, something is going on here, archaeologically speaking. So these ditches may be field boundaries and these circles, depending on their size, that's quite a big one there, but maybe some smaller ones around here, maybe, and this is a maybe hut circles. So this may represent a Bronze Age farming settlement. So people have come here to hunt in the Mesolithic. We've got some evidence they were here in the Neolithic, but it looks like they are starting to settle on the Isle of Axome in the Bronze Age. So we're going to quickly nip back into the Neolithic. I only did that one because they're in the same location um, to have a look at long barrows. So long barrows are a funerary monument, much like a great reused gravestones and graveyards today. A long barrow is the Neolithic way of commemorating the dead. Now, we actually know of a lot of long barrows um, from other places in Lincolnshire, such as on the Wolds. We see them in very high and visible places. So if we reflect that back to the Isle of Axo, remember we're on an island on the edge of the marsh. This is a high visible place and it has been suggested that there may be a long barrow just here, just to the side of Epworth near Melwood Grange. So you can see right on the edge of that contour line there overlooking these marshes. It is an intriguing possibility, but when I was doing my research for this talk, I couldn't find too much more evidence of it. So I would like to see more data um, to confirm this theory. And the other Neolithic monument I want to have a look at is a henge. So you may know um, henge from Stonehenge. Um, basically a henge is a ring ditch uh, that is often attributed to ritualistic purposes. So something to do with how people viewed the world and how they viewed um, the world working in their place within that. So this is just to the south of Beltoft and you can see, there we go, the farmer in this field has actually left this area unplowed to help preserve the archaeology, which is fantastic. Um, and it is suspected that we have a ditched ring here. So 
a henge ditched ring. It has entrances at the cardinal points, so it's an entrance to the north, the south, the east and the west and looks over the River Trent. Now we're not actually entirely sure what goes on in these uh, ring ditches and how they reflect um, the people's at the time world views. So I'll have to leave that one for another time. It's quite a difficult area to research. But what we do know is that people are investing their time and energy in uh, creating these monuments in the landscape. OK, so we've done the Mesolithic, we've done the Neolithic. We had a quick look at a possible Bronze Age settlement. We are actually going to skip past the Iron Age a little bit and move to the Roman period. So really swiftly moving through time here, as you can see. So this is at Santoft, Roman Santoft. Now here we have evidence once again from aerial photography, looking down um, from the sky and seeing crop marks that we have field systems and droveways. So these are ways, uh, routes that you would drive your animals down. Now this is possibly Roman in date. Um, we say that because in different time periods, people tend to favour different shapes of enclosures and fields, and these look like the shape of fields we um, attribute to the Roman period. However, no excavation has been done, so it could also be a bit later as well. We can't say this for sure. And now we're going to have a brief um, pause to have a look at a site in more detail. This is Roman Low Burnham, and one we are particularly excited about because presenting the past, our project, we actually did an excavation here. So we could talk about this in much greater detail. So Roman Low Burnham, you can see it's just between Low Burnham and Haxi here, just where the arrow is. And when we came to the area, we identified that an excavation had been conducted by the University of Bradford back in 2003. Now, unfortunately, the report was unpublished, so you won't be able to find it on the internet, but environmental samples that they took showed that wheat, charcoal and goosefoot were all in the area. So this tells us a few different things. So first of all, wheat. Wheat isn't that unsurprising. It's a common crop. It does suggest that we're looking in a farm area. People are growing food to survive. The presence of charcoal, also not that surprising. It simply shows that people are burning fires in the area. And of course, that could be associated with people simply trying to keep warm, people processing industries, people having a domestic dwelling in the area. Perhaps the more interesting one was the inclusion of goosefoot. Now, goosefoot is an interesting crop because today we see it as a weed. We do not grow it. It grows quite naturally by itself on verges and is more of a nuisance than anything else. However, it is edible. Um, it's perhaps not the most tasty crop you could go for. In fact, I think it's known to be quite bitter. However, it can grow quite happily in salty land. So it may be that the farm here was growing wheat as their main crop and then growing goosefoot almost as their backup crop in case of a bad year because goosefoot was particularly adapted to the salt in the landscape. It's an interesting theory. However, we were able to get on site with our fantastic team of volunteers to complete an excavation and do more research. So we opened up two trenches and you can see this is trench number one here. We dug it in two phases. This is the first and this is the second with the kind permission of the landowners. Now, what you can see here are lots of lines. So this yellow sandy soil, this is the natural soil. We're actually on a bit of a sand dune here. There's a big deposit of sand and dug into it, you can see these black lines. Now, these lines are ditches that were dug in the Roman time, um, Roman times to help create enclosures. There you go up there. And it's them that we were really interested in. So you can see uh, we got our volunteers to follow these lines and they dug slots so that we can identify how big these ditches were. And in them they found absolutely tons of Roman pottery. So we are sure this is a Roman site. However, what you can also see is that these lines are really confused. They're overlapping each other. You can't really see any regular layout. 
And so one theory that we've had when we've been doing our research on this is that it may be this was a site that was only used seasonally. So, for example, you bring your cattle or your sheep or your pigs down every summer to graze on the lower land before going back up to the winter when it floods. And every year they were recutting ditches, sometimes in different places, to suit their flocks and herds that they had at the time. This shape here we found really interesting. You can see it's something like a teardrop shape. It may have been used for funneling animals, for choosing which ones you're going to um, kill, which ones you're going to shear, which ones you're going to be selling on. And so it may have been part of the animal management procedure being used in the landscape. There we go. I just had to conclude some pictures of our volunteers. You can see them all cleaning there. And there you can see this is one of the ditches that was dug out, quite an irregular shape. So it may have been, for example, in the first year, they dug out this ditch shape and then next year they just simply widened it slightly, which is why we've got this step happening here. And there they are working in all sorts of conditions as well. And these are some of the finds. So lots and lots of bone was found, um, some big bones as well. So probably from your larger animals, pigs, cows, those kind of things. We've got some fantastic examples of Roman pottery. You can actually see a spout coming out there. And this is likely to have been imported pottery as well. So coming from perhaps the continent, perhaps France, um, which shows that this site wasn't a back end of nowhere. It was actually communicating regularly with the outside world. And they are getting some, that's some more domestic pottery there as well. Now, one curious thing we did find at this site is that we couldn't find any evidence of domestic dwellings. So there was uh, no houses, there was no, um, no evidence that people were living down here at all, really. So this is looking more like a farm area. But all in all, it was a fantastic excavation with a huge amount of uh, finds being produced. Now, at the time of recording, we're actually still completing the full report on this site, but the report will be made available through the Isle of Axome and Hatfield Chase Landscape Partnership, should you wish to read up on it. The other thing we can conclude is that we were really lucky with the weather. Our second trench was actually um, on clay, not sand. And so when the heavens opened on the last weekend, we got an absolute thunderstorm, that clay retained all the water and we created a little swimming pool for the farmers. So very lucky with the weather, but that is one thing about archaeology, you are always slightly dependent on the elements. And so after that foray into the Roman period, we're now going to move on again into the Anglo-Saxon period. So we're now moving on from this period here a little bit later. Now of course the Roman Empire failed, it um, collapsed and a new group of people moved into Lincolnshire, the Anglo-Saxons, and they were living quite differently to the Romans and we see this in the archaeological record. So we have an example of an Anglo-Saxon site near Belton, just over here, so quite close to this public footpath if you want to go and have a look at any time. And here, an archaeological uh, excavation found three probable structures. Two of these were clearer and they were identified as Glubenhauser or sunken buildings, which is quite characteristic of the Anglo-Saxon period. It's a typical form of dwelling structure. And then the third, um, third structure was a little bit more rough and ready. It may have been attributed to a storage space of some kind. Um, now, what was distinctive about this is We'll see the second bullet point here. The finds included locally produced pottery. This is pottery that we have not found anywhere else outside of North Lincolnshire. So it's only been found locally, it's only traded locally, it doesn't move very far. Now think back to the Roman period when we were seeing pottery from across Europe. So clearly something very different is going on in these two periods. This is perhaps a lot more insular. People aren't moving around as much. They're just living on their farmsteads. Um, might well be making pottery very close by and trading within small social groups, but it isn't going any further than that. The finds included bone pins, loom weights, that's used for weaving, and spindle whirls. This is all part of weaving, cloth making, 
industry. And then we also have pits used for clay extraction. So these are all industries that are being carried out on the site. You've got people living here, you've got people weaving here, you've got people extracting clay for pottery here. It's all happening in the local area. Another example is in Kroll. So when Kroll Marketplace was redeveloped in 2010, two Anglo-Saxon pits were discovered. One contained domestic waste. So this is what we call waste that comes from someone living in the nearby area. So grains from when someone's burnt their meal, pottery that someone's when they've broken a bowl, animal bones once again from eating food. And that dated to around the 10th, 11th century. And the other contained a bowl and iron smithing waste. Now this is quite interesting in a way because it's almost like people have divided not only their living space, but how they're throwing things away as well. They have one area for living and one area for industry, for making things. So we do have evidence of further occupation in the area, but this isn't the whole picture, it's only two pits. And moving slowly into the medieval period now. So we are just above to the north of Oston Ferry near Low Melwood. And here we have the Carthusian Priory, also known as Axone Priory or Low Melwood Priory. It is this site of an early shrine and chapel that was dedicated to the Virgin Mary. Um, now we have lots and lots of written records about this. We actually have a papal bull of 1398 that described it as the most ancient priory of the wood. So we can also from that take to mean that there may have been lots more trees around here at the time as well. Now a small excavation was completed by St John's College of York in 1968. Now unfortunately with the, once again with these earlier digs, as it often happens, the report was unpublished and we don't know where the finds are now, so we presume they've been lost. However, a more recent uh, resistivity survey, that is geophysics, when we're using machines and the moisture content of the soil to understand what's underneath. Um, when that was carried out, it showed the walls of the cloister really clearly. Indeed, if you are able to look at that area today, it is private land, but if you are able to look across there, you can see the lumps and bumps in the landscape really clearly. So this could be a really, really interesting excavation in the future, should the opportunity ever come up. And then believe it or not, the Isle of Axone also has its own castle. Now this is located in Oston Ferry itself, and it was built around 1080-ish um, and was refortified by the Mowbray family in the 12th century. So a Mott and Bailey castle is a fortification. Um, it is often made of wood or stone, and it's a stone keep or tower on a raised earthwork, which is called a Mott. And then it is accompanied by an enclosed courtyard or a Bailey, which is surrounded by a protective ditch and palisade. So you've got the stone tower, this keep on top of the Mott surrounded by the Bailey, and that's where the name comes from. Now, really excitingly, this um, this site was actually digitised and a, a short video was created by the Isle of Axel and Hatfield Chase, Land, Hatfield Chase Landscape Partnership. So we're going to take a quick look at it now. And to the side, when they start talking about the excavation, I've done a small little diagram um, just to help you visualise the different things people were finding. Brought to you by the Heritage Lottery funded Isle of Axe with Hatfield Chase Landscape Partnership. The video reconstruction is of Oston Castle in Oston Ferry, or sometimes it's known as St Kinnard's Castle. Modern Bailey castles are medieval fortifications introduced into the region by the Normans. There are over 600 mock castles and modern Bailey castles recorded nationally. Oston Castle was one of many castles built soon after the Norman Conquest. The castle was built in a strategic position in order to control the major waterways of the Humber Wetlands. 
The Master Bailey Castle is a fortification with a wooden or stone keep situated on a raised earthwork called a mot, which was usually enclosed by a bailey. The castle was typically surrounded by a protective ditch and palisade. Oston Castle is believed to have been an entirely wooden structure owned by Geoffrey de Wers, Lord of Axel, at some point after 1086, as it isn't recorded in the Doomsday Book. The first documentary reference to the castle appears in 1095, when the castle was partially dismantled during the rebellion against King William II. The castle's strategic location in the Lower Trent Valley would have afforded control of the Cross Trent Ferry and access in and out of the Alamaxo. During the revolt against Henry II, between 1173 and 1174, Boston Castle was refortified and became a stronghold of Roger de Mowbray. It was a supporter of Henry II's cause. After rebellion against the Plantagians in 1174, the castle was taken and slighted by royal forces led by Geoffrey Plantagenet. Geoffrey was the illegitimate son of Henry II. He was Bishop elect of Lincoln and later Archbishop of York. An archaeological washing bridge was conducted in May 1935 at the Mossy Bay Castle site. Five phases of history were identified. Phase one. An unrated phase, the right to the natural water channels cut in to Rivia Grace. Phase two. A series of post pits were recorded. Dated from 1070 to 1095, these are thought to be a palisade associated with a walking or fighting platform. Phase 3, dated from possible 1173 to 1174, the palisade has now been partially removed and a rampart reformed with compacted red clays. Phase 4, an undated phase, possibly showing the disposal of ash and clay refuge into a hallway. Alternatively, it, it, it could be the deliberate surfacing of an occupied area. Phase 5. In a data phase, extensive deposits of mixed clay contain late 10th to 13th century pottery overlaid by topsoil. Unfazed feature. A possible bit in the east face of the excavation contained a single shirt of Roman greyware, probably from the 2nd century. But this may have been essential. The watching brief report concluded that the most dateful deposits of the 11th to 12th centuries survive in the vicinity. The Palisade position confirms the idea that Church Street follows the northern course of the artifact, which was filled in no earlier than the late 12th century.
Okay, so that is Oston Ferry Castle. Moving on, we have what is commonly known as a DMV. So this is a deserted medieval village. Now, a lot of villages were deserted in the medieval period, um, quite possibly quite mainly due to the Black Plague, which did massively depopulate the country. And so, of course, as villages contracted, some of them became too small to be viable. And so people would move away to other villages. And so we have this phenomenon of deserted medieval villages occurring across the UK. And they are often identified as lots of lumps and bumps in the ground. Um, and then when we check documents such as the Doomsday Book, we find that there was actually once a village there. And now we have one of these on the Isle of Axone. So this is High Burnham which is really just a farmstead now, but slight earthworks were noticed in the fields during a site visit in the 1990s. Now, a community field walking operation recovered large amounts of medieval pottery from the same area, which seems to confirm that it is indeed a deserted medieval village. Now, research shows that this was mentioned in the Doomsday Book, so once again, looking likely. However, when they completed some geophysics work here, it wasn't as successful. It didn't really find um, what was going on because the ground was really, really waterlogged. And that can affect the results that geophysics come up with. And so it'd be interesting to see this work redone um, and get more details about it because it'll be quite an interesting site. And now I'm going to treat you to one more video, um, and this is of Vinegarth. Now this is in Epworth and is a medieval manor on the Isle of Axone. So we've gone from um, the Motton Bailey Castle, the defences, to the deserted medieval village where people were living in there every day, to where the upper classes were living. So Vinegarth was actually home to one of the greatest families in England in the Middle Ages, the Mowbrays. They were connected with royalty and they were very rich and this was their house. There we go. So that is a quick look at Vinegarth Manor. So I'm hoping you're not sat there at the moment with your mind completely blown with all these sites and all this information I've just thrown at you. But if you are, please don't worry. I have just thrown a lot of information at you. That feeling is totally um, valid. Um, however, it just shows the density of archaeological sites that we have on the Isle of Axone from the Stone Age right up to the medieval period and beyond. I haven't gone beyond because um, there are just so many. Now, what patterns can we see? Because that is a really interesting one. So if you remember right back in the Stone Age, we have basically an island in the marshes and this is a productive landscape there's lots of food to be found around here so it is attracting people in this is why we see these mesolithic um, sites we have some evidence that people stayed here later on the neolithic and the bronze age although we do need to do more work and more excavation to really tell those stories by the time the romans come along it's still farming, they are still farming here. People know this land is good for food production. 
moving on to the Anglo-Saxons, and they are still farming, they're still living here. Once we hit the medieval period, things start to diversify out a little bit more. We have the castles and we have the manor house. So it's also a place that's being used as a statement of power. This is where you have your land. This is where you defend your land. And this is where the rich people are building their manors. And once again, probably attracted because of the value of this landscape, the value of the agriculture within it. It makes it productive, it makes it worthy of being fought over. And so overall, the Isle of Axome has a fascinating story, but it is a story that is inherently tied to agriculture and farming. And if you're more interested in that, then please do have a look at our Farming on the Isle course as well, which goes a little bit deeper into this farming story. And there we go. This is now our break time. So as I said before, even if you don't feel like you need a break, I do recommend you just pause this right now, that you get up, step away from the screen for a little bit, make yourself a cup of tea, go for a wander, just to give yourself a break. And I will see you once you're ready to come back. Okay, so let's get started again. Hopefully you've had a nice break. So quick, quick recap for you. So far, we have been looking at landscape archaeology and the sites on the Arvaxo. So we're looking very much at the broad landscape picture. Next, we're going to be looking at artifacts and how we can use those artifacts to tell a story. Before we really get into artifacts, I do want to have a look at context, so how these artifacts have been found. Now, because how they're found does change the story it tells about them. I love this little picture of pizza in two different scenarios. It tells a very different story, but it's the exact same pizza. So we have to look at the whole story, the whole picture, to really interpret an artifact. So artefacts are often found through archaeological excavation by people doing field walking. Um, a lot of artefacts are found by farmers just doing agricultural work on the land or by accident. Um, a lot of artefacts are found by dog walkers, for example. Artefacts can be found by anyone. So we're going to take a quick note here of if you find an artefact. So if you find an artefact, please do make a note of the location because if it is an important artifact, we need to know exactly where it came from, because we need to know this wider picture. We need to know where it came from. You need to alert the landowner, because um, we'll discuss it a little bit more in a moment, but it has implications for who owns the artifact. And you also need to talk to your local flow, and that is your finds liaison officer. And that their details can be found really easily online. And this is where we get into an absolutely fantastic scheme in this country called the Portable Antiquities Scheme. If you've not heard of it before, I do recommend you pop online onto their website. They hold a database of a lot of different artifacts that have been found by different people, um, often metal detectorists, but they can, like I said, be found by anyone. And you can access these online to find out about the artifacts that are being found in your area and use that to really build a picture of who was living in your area and what they were doing. Now, the Portable Antiquities Scheme is run out of the British Museum and they have a dedicated flow that's finds liaison officer each area of the country. So for example, Lincolnshire has a flow based at Lincoln um, County Council and North Lincolnshire has a flow, I believe, based in Scunthorpe Museum. The role of these flows are to identify, record and importantly return artefacts. They are not there to confiscate these interesting artefacts from you. They simply want to make sure that we have a record that they were found and that they are properly um, noted down so that we can start to identify patterns and pictures of what is going on in this country. And this ensures that the artefacts context is protected. We know where things are coming from. 
Now, flows mostly work with metal detectorists because they are the ones coming with the bulk of material after the ground, but they are happy to hear from anyone. So please do just give them an email, ask them a question, and I'm sure they will get back to you. So without further ado, let's look at the artifacts. Now, how we're going to be structuring this is slightly differently. I am keeping the timeline that we have down, there we go, down the side, just so that you can see where we are in history. I do find that quite useful, but we are not going to be working through artifacts chronologically. Instead, I want to show you all the different ways you can use to interpret artifacts. And so we're going to be going through different aspects, such as the who, the how, the where, the why, the when, and all the different stories these can tell about an artifact and tell the bigger stories that the artifact is trying to tell us as well. So we're going to start with some examples of some tokens and we're going to start with the who. So how we can figure out who is behind an artifact. Now, artifacts we can refer to as social indicators as they tell us which social groups are in an area. If you think of it in today's terms, you can judge someone's wealth by the type of car they own or the phone they have in their pocket or the clothes that they're wearing. What we own defines where we are in a social class. So first of all, we need to look at the artifact. What is the artifact? Some artifacts are only owned by the rich. So if you get something that's made out of very precious metals, then we know we're dealing with a richer person. The type of artifact can suggest a date. And if we know what people were around in this area in that time, that can help narrow down the who who is behind the artifact. Sometimes we'll get artifacts with decoration and images that actually depict a person as well. Think of coins for that example. Sometimes there is text or inscriptions that can give us a name. We actually have some examples of medieval tiles where um, the names of the families were inscribed into the tiles. Context can actually be key here as well. So we've been talking a lot about artifacts that are found in fields, but what about an artifact found in someone's house? Perhaps an heirloom that's been passed down through generations. Well, that's going to be really useful, that context for understanding who it belonged to, most likely one of that person's ancestors. Also important to look at are artists, artist marks, makers marks, manufacturers marks, because of course an artifact does not just come from the person who owns it, but also the person who made it. So once again, think of a painting where the artist has signed the bottom, but it is owned by someone else. So the example that I'm going to use here is of this 17th century trade token. Now, this was found near Epworth and it's made from a metal alloy issued by Richard Parnell from in the 1600s at some point. Now, this is actually now kept in the British Museum. It's not on display, but it is considered important enough to be kept at the British Museum. Now, this artifact tells a story, especially when we start to research what a trade token is and who Richard Parnell was. So trade tokens came about due to a failure of Parliament to produce enough sufficient small denomination coinage. So that's like your one P's and your two P's. People needed them, especially traders. And so traders began to produce their own, of which this is one and they would inscribe it with their Christian name and their surname, their trade and occupation and where they resided. And so this is where the who comes in. It is actually inscribed. You can see just here, the Richard Parnell of Epworth. That is an absolutely fantastic reference as to the who. Sometimes they also had the value of them. Sometimes it had the initials of uh, initials of the issuer and his wife. Uh, sometimes it had a device or a coat of arms on it. So really telling a story of the people who were in this area. They were usually struck in copper, copper or brass. And so they were really this very, very small denomination change. The majority were like this. They were round. 
Um, but we do also have square examples, heart-shaped examples, diamond examples, octagonal examples. So really showing the diversity of people who are making and using them. However, as you'd expect, generally they were not of great quality. And so in, if you find one of these in good condition, they are increasingly sought because it gives a fascinating picture of the government and parliament at this time. And of course, this is, this is civil war time, which is why there are different pressures upon the government purse. So what can we tell about this? What can we tell about the who behind this artifact? This isn't just a small penny found in the ground. This is telling us a story. So first of all, it's telling us the story of Parliament, these really big um, pressures that are going on, how they're not issuing enough coinage, how traders are being creative and finding their own solutions. But it also tells us the story of this Richard Parnell of Epworth. We know for a fact, straight away, that he issued his own tokens, and therefore he was probably a trader in the area. Now, we can actually research people's surnames to find out more about them. And what we found out when I did my own research on this is that I found there were several Parnells who were living in the area and they were actually Quakers. And they actually suffered for the adherence they had to their own te tenants. We also have evidence that a Parnell did not pay a priest his smoke money. And so he had 13 shillings worth of goods confiscated. So this may tell a story of a Parnell, probably living a generation after Richard, who was perhaps struggling for his own money. And so he was um, having fines because he couldn't pay his taxes. So this is probably a poorer family, a trading family, a Quaker family. All these different stories coming from this single coin. I'm going to include another example of another trade token as well. And this one was found in Hexi. And this one is a little bit more faded, was issued by Anthony Barnby. There we are coming up there, Barnby. He also issued tokens. Now, if we look up his name in the local parish registers, we find that he also registered for the baptism of several children. So I believe uh, Anthony's children were Elizabeth, Maria or Mary, that one wasn't so clear, another Elizabeth and, and Anthony. We then have record that one of these Elizabeths were, was married to an Alexander later on. And however, Mary or Maria and Anthony both died fairly on in childhood. So these two artifacts, these two artifacts that look quite probably dull when you look at them originally, tell the story of two men, two very, very specific men from between three and 400 years ago, which I find amazing. These artifacts tell us of these men's occupation, so what people were doing in the area, as well as the larger economic problem of the time. Because we're then able to use those names to find out other details, we know that the Parnells were Quakers living in the area and that they were very strict, which brought them into conflict. Likewise, in Anthony Barnby's story, we find out about the story of high child mortality that was being played out here in ordinary people's lives. This was a man who lost two of his four children. Without these tokens and without these names, we would struggle to match these stories together. And so now we're going to use artifacts to explain the how. Artifacts are also products. They have been created, and so they all have a manufacture process that we can explore. So the first thing to examine is the materials and the manufacture process. So what is the artifact made of? What properties does that have? For example, metal is strong, stone is heavy, wood is easy to shape and readily available. So when you look at an artifact, the first thing to ask is why was it made of this material? Now that might sound like a simplistic question. But as we're going to see, it's not that easy. 
So these here are Bronze Age axe heads that were found across the aisle. So we could ask ourselves that, why was metal selected? And no, I'm not asking you a trick question here. It sounds simplistic. Metal is a strong material. We use it today for knives. We use it today for axes. So of course it's going to be used for an axe head. However, These axe heads are not all they appear to be. When they were found, they were still filled with the sand that they were used for the mold. So these axe heads were never used. The metal had seeped through the small gaps of the two halves that were joined together. So they hadn't been cleaned properly. So when archeologists took a closer look at what this metal was made of, they found a bronze alloy with a really high concentration of tin or lead. Now, this is actually really interesting when you start really drilling down into the basics of what the metal components are. Tin would give a really, really shiny axe, very, very pretty to look at. But tin is a very, very brittle metal. And when you have too much of it in your alloy, you can't use it because the it will become too easy to snap and break. These axes could never, even if they had been cleaned out, could never have been used as actual working tools. So why, why were they made? They would have been very pretty, very shiny to look at, but not actually used as axes. So understanding the how they were made and what they're made of is actually telling us a different story. These are not axes for chopping. So why were they made? And why were they buried? They could have been buried by, for example, a traveling metal worker to come back and dig them up at a later date. Perhaps there was times of trouble, there was fighting around, and so he quickly buried his stash so he could return later and collect them. Unfortunately, he never did so. Some people believe that these hordes of socketed axes were buried as gifts to the gods. They were valuable objects, and so they were putting beyond the realm of mortals. And as gifts, they would not need to be used, and so they could be made to look good rather than to be practical. However, this issue, the issue of axe head hordes, is one that is under massive discussion, and there's lots of different theories behind it. However, it is interesting that if we go further back to the Stone Age, stone axes were often um, taken from stone from really high places. And specifically, it seems taken from very, very scenic locations. And so it may have been that there was some sort of power attributed to these objects. They came from beautiful locations, and so they had more of a power in themselves. And so perhaps this is almost a different interpretation. Beautiful objects, beautiful axe heads being buried and treated as special objects. They are more of a symbol than they are a practical tool. Another how I want to look at is a talk. Now, this one was found on the Isle of Axome. However, it was found so long ago that records don't really exist for exactly where it was found. So I can't give any more details than that. Unfortunately, that has been lost. So another thing to think about the material is not just how practical it'd be to use, but also about the cultural value. So if I ask you now and I ask you, is gold a precious metal? You'd say, of course, we value gold very highly. Now, a talk is an ornament that goes around the waist or the neck, depending on how big it is. A stronger talk could have been made with bronze, but these people selected gold. Why is that? Now, gold talks are a famous piece of Bronze Age jewellery. They are made using very, very, very sophisticated gold working techniques. You can see how finely it's been twisted around itself, this single wire. It's beautiful. There we go. Now, a more practical talk could have been made out of bronze, but they chose gold. And we have to ask ourselves, why is this? 
perhaps even back in the Bronze Age, a greater value was placed to gold. And that does seem to have been the case. It seems to have been a highly valued metal throughout all ages. And much of that is probably due to the colour. It's a very, very distinctive colour, a very, very bright colour. Um, and it's probably a, a statement of wealth and status. And so moving on to the where, and this is actually one of the artefacts I am most excited to talk about because it is so interesting. So next we're going to consider where an artefact has come from and what that tells us about trade in the past. And this comes down to a few more specific questions. So where could the material have come from? Where could the design and the manufacture and the skills to make it have come from? For example, was the product made where it was excavated and then transported, or was it a many stage process? And then once we identify where we have trade, we are identifying the movement of people. We are identifying the movement of ideas. We're even identifying the movement of things such as disease as well. So this beautiful artifact is a jadeite axe, and this was found around root. Now this is um, distinctive because jadeite is not found in Britain. Our recent analysis of a very, very detailed project has found that this axe was actually sourced from stone in the North Italian Alps, and we've dated it to around 4,300 BC. So that is over 6,000 years ago people were traveling and this object traveled from the North Italian Alps all the way to route to the Isle of Axone. Now, once again, this ax head would not have been intended for use. It is, it is a display object. This is a ritual object. And as I was saying before, it is thought that Neolithic people considered certain stones sourced from difficult to reach places such as high upon mountains to have special supernatural powers. Perhaps they thought that a bit of that supernatural power from that very beautiful scenic spot up in the Alps would rub off on the person who was wearing it. If you want to find out more about this object, have a look at the BBC and British Museum collaboration of a history in the world and a hundred objects. This is actually one of the objects they discuss on it, one of the hundred. Um, and once again, coming from the Isle of Axone. So a really interesting story there, and I do recommend you look it up further. Another where that we can consider with an artifact is considering how the ideas for an artifact spread. Now, this is not actually a picture of the artifact. I've looked everywhere and I cannot find a picture of this artifact. So this is just a modern day example of what it may have looked like. Now, a complete blue glass bead was found during a community archeology span fieldworking project um, around 2004. Now, this is actually more exciting than it sounds um, because it shows us the spread of a culture. It was originally thought to be a Roman bead, but we now think it is Viking Age and similar to other ones that have been found in York. Now, in this period, we have the Vikings moving across huge areas, and it wasn't just pillaging different countries. They were also trading with people in the areas. But we do not have much evidence that the Vikings were using coins. So how do you make a long distance ex exchange economy work without coins. We suspect that some commodities, some products and artifacts were exchanged regularly as if they were cash. Later on, this would uh, lead to small pieces of precious metal um, being traded in later periods, which will then eventually lead to the standardized coins that we find in the later Middle Ages. However, in this earlier period, the long distance, distance exchange item that seems to have been used in every market, on every farm, in every cemetery, was glass beads. And so these are actually keys to understanding the trade routes of Northern Europe in an era before minted coins and before written trade records began. So the wear of these beads tells a really interesting story. 
Now, just down the road in Lincoln, we actually have evidence that a glass bead workshop was actually in operation in sites across the city. Which suggests that Lincoln and Lincolnshire was a production area, was a highly important area for creating this economy and spreading it across the area. Probably quite rich in that respect as well. And then where this glass bead was found was probably within a settlement context, probably a dropped bead that's been lost, much like someone dropping a couple of coins today and becoming a lost find. So once again, a seemingly simple object, a bead, but it's telling us a story of settlement and trade across the Viking period about production and Lincoln, about how people are using that in different areas. It shows us the spread of a culture. And now we're going to move on to the why. So objects and artifacts are made for a reason. So we also need to look at why they were made. Now, to help us understand this, we can look at what's left on the surface. We can look at wear and damage. We can look at how they've been repaired and reused and then how they've decayed. All of this can tell us about how an object was used. Now, this rather ordinary looking stone is perhaps not the most interesting of artifacts, um, but it does tell a small story in itself. Now, this is a limestone cobble, possibly an unfinished weight. So someone was drilling a hole through here to use as a weight on a loom. However, what is clear is this drilling, and we found evidence of the drilling, you can see the wear marks in there, was abandoned. Now, weights were used for all sorts of things at the time. They used for a variety of purpose, purposes. Fishing was one of the key ones. And we do actually see that fishing and uh, fishing for eels was one of the main um, industries in the Isle of Axone around the Doomsday Book time. So this may have been part of this industry. So I wanted to include perhaps a more boring looking artifact just as a quick example to show that anything can tell a story. But um, this was an abandoned weight, which leads to a number of more questions. Who was trying to drill for it? What were they trying to do? Um, however, it is still telling us the story of this industry. Uh, this eel rendering industry, who were using weights. Now, this is perhaps a more interesting one. So, buckles. Now, earlier on, we looked at socketed axe heads from the Bronze Age that were made but never used. There were no marks on the edge of the artifacts to show that they've been used, the small dents and chips. However, how can we tell this artifact has been used? Now, this, once again, found in the Isle of Axone, is a copper alloy pin that would have come from a medieval buckle or brooch. And we think it dates from around AD 1200 or AD 1400. Now, you can see here the loop of the pin, and then you've got the shaft. Now, these are almost square in subsection. If you can see, just if we go down here, this part of the loop here is significantly thinner than this part. And we've got a lovely little depression here where it's become worn and almost beaked in shape. The pin has become green with age. And this is all telling us a story of use. This has probably become worn down here and worn up here. And so if you're looking for use marks that's what we're looking for the scratches for the dents for where it's become worn down and used um so that is that one there on to the when and this is perhaps a bit more interesting so objects are also part of the past 
and they can tell us multiple different stories through time, not just the time that they were used and then abandoned, but all the time since then. So, for example, this is quite a famous shoe from the area. It could be telling us many stories. It could be telling us the story of the Roman woman who wore it. It could be telling us the story of the 17th century peat diggers who found it when digging peat. It could be telling us the story of the antiquarian archaeologists who researched it and found it interesting. Or it could be telling us the perhaps morbid interest of the public today in the bog body of the body who was wearing it. Indeed, there was over £7,000 spent to have this displayed in the school holidays. So let's look at the story in a bit more detail. So in the summer of 1747, a peat digger unearthed the body of a woman through roughly six feet of peat moss. Understandably, the man quickly fled after his shovel struck a shoe with the partial remains of a human foot inside. The following October, an antiquarian, an archaeological antiquarian called Dr. Called Dr. George Stovin, heard of the discovery and set out with his team to finish the excavation. He concluded that the woman's body was bent, so her head and feet were close to touching. A pair of shoes were found. One had been, of course, been damaged by the shovel of the discoverer. And they were said to have had a tawny colour and still be pliable, which is really fascinating. Now, investigation into this and into the original documentary records led to the rediscovery of one of these shoes which was taken in 1747. Now, there is a form of dating called typology. And this is when we look at the style of a certain object and place it in time to when we find objects of that style. So you can find typologies of coins, of pots, um, of clothing and what you do is you take your artifact you match it to the closest one on that typology and that gives you a date because fashion is always changing. Now when people had a look at the shoe and um, they tried to match the shoe to what else was found in time they identified that it looked like medieval footwear so they identified this woman as being a medieval woman who had drowned um, at some point during her life. However, recent advances in footwear studies and also examination of the early drawings of the shoes show that this construction of a shoe from one piece of animal material is common in Northern Europe in the later Roman period. So we're actually looking at a Roman bog, bodies, bog body. There we go. Much of this information has now been lost, unfortunately. I think one or both shoes have been lost, so we can't see them today. However, it does tell a story. It tells a story of both the medieval period and the shoes they were wearing and the Roman period when this woman actually came from. And of course, raises a lot of questions as to how this woman became in this situation. We can tell the story of the peak diggers, of the antiquarians, and of course, the people who are fascinated with bog bodies today. Lots and lots of different stories, one artifact. And this is the last artifact we're going to look at in our when. So this is a gold Iron Age coin. It was um, it is interesting because it is from the northeast and it's attributed to the I'm gonna have to get this right, it's attributed to the Coriol Talvi tribe in the Iron Age. So this is probably dating from between 50 BC and 20 BC.
And as we can see, it has the image of a horse on it. Now, this is actually quite common with the Iron Age period in Britain. Horse imagery was really, really common. Now, what's interesting is we do not think that the Iron Age economy was coin bearing. So why, why did they create their own coins? Now, this is part of the uh, expansion of the Roman Empire. Of course, the Romans would eventually come across to Britain, but there was actually trade going on between them in the meantime. And this is almost a copy and imitation of the coin economy in the Roman period. And now the ones they would have seen in the Roman period were imitations of Greek coins. Now on Greek coins, the head of Apollo was featured wearing a laurel wreath. And they often depicted a two horse chariot on the back, which of course, according to Greek mythology, was what Apollo would use to uh, transport the sun across the sky. Now here, this mythology of the horse on the coin has been transformed into a Coriol Talvian horse, which is made up of crescents, as we can see, lots and lots of crescents, this shape, which is more distinctive of Iron Age artistry. Now, on one hand, this could just be a coin that just tells us when it was from the Iron Age. However, the when is more intriguing than that. It's telling us a story of changing times, of a people being influenced by other cultures while still retaining some of their own identity. These were probably not used as money, but exchanged as gifts between rulers and buried in the ground as gifts to gods. And so it is being used in a very different way to the continent. So it's telling us about a very specific time in history when people are trying to find a new identity in a changing world. So if you are walking along in a field um, and you find an artifact, this is the kind of structure that can be useful to help interpret it. So first start with the who. Are there any decorations or text? Are there any maker's marks that you could use to identify the people behind this artifact? Where? Where are the materials from? Where is the design from? Why? How has it been used? Where are there where marks? Why was it created as a piece? What's its function? And when? When did it originate from? And how many different stories through time can it tell? All of these questions can, they're not the, they're not, they won't get you to the end, but they can start those lines of investigation to use a single artifact to tell many different stories. So if you think about how many different stories a single artifact can tell us, once you start then broadening that out into artifacts in a group, that can tell us even more. So once again, we've got a woman in her bag and we've got all the different things in her bag and every single one of those things, for example, flat shoes, who wears them, why are they being used, why are they in the bag, what time are they from, tells us even more stories. Put them together and you've got an absolute mountain of information to tell, to read and tell. And so it's interesting to try and think of what assemblages we can find in the Isle of Axone today. Some of them might be found through archaeological excavation. Some of them we can identify on the Port of Antiquities website. But some of them might be in your attic. They might be a box of heirlooms you've carried down through the ages. They might be artefacts that are still found in a church today. All these different assemblages can tell us even more stories. And so it's time to tell the story. By bringing together these different pieces of evidence, the landscape archaeology, the sites, the artefacts, the stories, we can start to construct a narrative. We can tell a story on the Isle of Axe home of not just farming and agriculture, but of the different people who lived here, the different pressures they were put under, and really start to tell that story through history. Some gaps, by more research and more um, 
more scientific evidence and more excavation we can fill. Some gaps we will never be able to fill. So if you have a think back, or if you have a listen back to this uh, lecture another time, try and think what stories we can tell from what we've investigated so far. So just a recap to telling your own narrative. I find it best to start small and work my way out. Start with the artifacts. And then what sites do you have at the same period? So for example, if I'm investigating a Roman artifact that are found on the Isle of Axome, I'll research that, but then I'll have a look at what sites in the Isle of Axome we have from the Roman period. What is the landscape it fits into? And there we go, yeah. how do these sites then fit into a landscape? And through that, I'm really understanding the Roman period in this time. If you repeat that for every time frame, you are going to have a really good, a really in-depth understanding of the history, the narrative of an area. Then the last thing is what questions do you have left? And you will always have questions. You will never, ever, ever completely fill out a story. And then it's time to really explore where you could look to find the answers. Could you contact an expert? Could you go to a museum? What else can you do to fill in your narrative? And then number five, look at context from elsewhere. So if you're really stuck at a dead end, have a look at your artifact, have a look at your site and try and look at other places in the country or even the world where that site or artifact is found. And then you can compare, perhaps that can fill in a bit of your story that what you don't have evidence for in your own area, you can at least presume that there would be a good chance that that would be happening. So for example, if I found a gold ring that had a very, very distinctive mark and I was stuck at a dead end, but then discovered that, that gold ring with that mark had been found elsewhere in the country, that would be worth my attention as well to help understand what's happening in my own area. So what narratives have you made? Have you made any um, by going through this? And this is where I want us to do a little bit of an example exercise. So, if you remember at the beginning, I asked you to bring a bag along with you. Um, any bag, it could be a handbag, a sports bag, a work bag. Um, now, normally when this is face to face, I would present you with a bag from a stranger and uh, normally one that I borrowed off of someone in the office. And I'd ask you to empty out that bag and try and tell me about that person based on what you found. And it is surprising how accurate people can be. So if you want to pause this now, I recommend you take your bag and empty it out. Empty out everything, even the rubbish, the little bits of dirt at the bottom and the spare coins. What can you tell about that person? I will leave you for a pause now and then come back to discuss that further. Okay, hopefully you got on okay with that activity if you decided to go for it. That is just an example of when we put information together, what it can start to tell us. But I also want to make the point that it doesn't tell us everything. Now, I did this activity with a group in person a while ago, and I gave them two bags. I didn't tell them they were both my bags. One of them was my handbag. It was my work bag uh, that I used to go into work every day. The other was my bag that I use when I go out on site. It's my archaeological bag. And so they both had different things in. The group with the handbag identified an organised person who liked her sweet treats, judging by the number of chocolate wrappers they found in there. They found someone who had an organised purse um, and who gave money to different charities based on the cards that they found in that purse. They identified from an appointment card in there that this person was pregnant and was um, due her next doctor's appointment soon. They identified therefore that person was female and that the bag being of quite nice quality um, was probably a bag someone liked people to see. Um, it wasn't one that was hidden away in the house. 
the other group found a bag that was almost falling apart and was filled with soil. It had trowels in and work tools in there. There was no clear indication as to whether this person was male or female. It had lots of pens and pencils in there. And um, it had a water bottle in there as well. And so they identified someone who was working outside, working with their hands, who might be skilled in that area. Now, both of those bags describe two very different people, where of course it's actually describing one person. So always be aware of bias as well. You're not always seeing the whole story. And that concludes our archeology span on the aisle presentation. Hopefully that's given you a really quick run through of just some of the sites and the artifacts found on the Isle of Axone, but also how to interpret them and use them to tell the narrative, the story of this area. Now, of course, we have to pause here to say thank you to the Isle of Axome and Hatfield Chase Landscape Partnership for providing the funding and the commission to do this work, as well as all the local people in the area who requested this workshop and who have experienced it um, the couple of times before that I've done it. Of course, this is run through North Lincolnshire Council and funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. So for all of you who have bought a lottery ticket, you are helping to fund this work and to fund these opportunities. Should you wish to find out anything more about Heritage Lincolnshire, I do recommend you look us up on the website. Um, and of course, we have other digital courses available on the Isle of Axo and Hat Hatfield Chase website as well. Thank you so much for listening, and I really hope that you have learned something through this course. Thank you very much.